Separation of Corporation and State, A Short History of Psychological Warfare. Psychological warfare is any action which is practiced mainly by psychological methods with the purpose of evoking a planned psychological reaction in other people. It has also been known by many other names or terms, such as psyops, political warfare, hearts and minds, active measures, and propaganda. Various techniques are used and are aimed at influencing a target audience's value system, belief system, emotions, motives, reasoning, or behavior. It's used to obtain confessions or reinforce attitudes and behaviors favorable to the originator's objectives, and are sometimes combined with black operations or false flag tactics. It is also used to compromise the target's psychological state of mind, mainly using the media and technology. Target audiences can be governments, organizations, groups, and individuals. These techniques are difficult to defend against because it uses people's core beliefs, identity, and emotions against them. Early Psychological Warfare For thousands of years, warlords, chiefs, and others who hold power have recognized the importance of inducing psychological terror in opponents. Facing armies would shout, hurl insults at each other, beat weapons together, or on shields prior to an engagement, all designed to intimidate and scare the enemy. Massacres and other atrocities were certainly first employed at this time to subdue enemy or rebellious populations, or to get an enemy to abandon their struggle. One ancient example includes the Battle of Pelusium in 525 BC, in which the Egyptians were decisively defeated by the Persians. The Persian forces used cats and other animals as a psychological tactic against the Egyptians, who avoided harming cats due to seeing them as being sacred and would not injure them on any account. The Persians painted images of the cat goddess Beset on their shields. According to legend, the Persian army also carried the sacred animals in front of them during the attack as well, hurling them at the Egyptians. The Egyptians did not shoot their arrows for fear of wounding the animals. The city of Pelusium was stormed successfully. The battle is one of the earliest known examples of the use of psychological warfare. Another example of psychological warfare was implemented in ancient Macedonia. Philip II of Macedonia, father of Alexander the Great, took the throne in 359 BC. At that time, Macedonia was a fractured backwater subject. In less than a year, Philip crushed all internal threats and laid the foundation for Macedonia to become an ancient superpower. When doing battle with the Chalcidian League, a federal state that existed on the Chalcidus Peninsula, Philip destroyed the city of Stagoras. According to ancient accounts, it would have been hard for a visitor to tell that the city had ever been inhabited. The remaining Chaldidian cities were surrendered without resistance. During the Battle of Chironia in 338 BC, Philip used two main strategies of psychological warfare. First, he tired out Athenian and Theban rebels through boredom, forcing them to wait in the blistering sun. Then he made a false attack, which drew them toward a slowly retreating front line that ensnared them. Later, Philip's son, Alexander the Great, successfully conquered large parts of Europe and the Middle East. He held on to his territorial gains by integrating local elites into the Greek administration and culture. Alexander left some of his men behind in each conquered city to introduce Greek culture and suppress opposing views. His soldiers were paid to marry locals in an effort to encourage assimilation of the local population. Genghis Khan, leader of the Mongolian Empire in the 13th century AD, employed less subtle techniques. Defeating the will of the enemy and reaching a settlement before having to attack what was the preferable option to actually fighting. The Mongol generals demanded submission to the Khan and threatened the initially captured villages with complete destruction if they refused to surrender. If they tried to fight back, Mongol generals fulfilled their threats and massacred all the survivors. Tales of the encroaching horde spread to the next villages and created an aura of fear that quelled the possibility of future resistance. The Khan also employed tactics that made his numbers seem greater than they actually were. 
During night operations, he ordered each soldier to light three torches at dusk to give the illusion of an overwhelming army and deceive enemy scouts. His soldiers also used arrows that were notched to whistle loudly as they flew through the air, creating a terrifying noise. Another favorite tactic used by the Mongols was catapulting severed human heads over city walls to frighten the inhabitants and spread disease in the besieged city's closed confines. In ancient China, King Gojian of the state of Yu, who reigned from 496 BC to 465 BC, was warring with the state of Wu. Gojian eventually overcame his adversary and annexed the territory of Wu. One of the psychological warfare techniques he used was to have his frontline soldiers, typically criminals who were sentenced to death, slit their own throats and kill themselves. This was done to show the other side that the soldiers were willing to die. This also reflected an ancient Chinese worldview of the time that a person would be compensated for sacrifices made during life. Another example includes the Aztecs. Decades ago, odd skull-shaped grave items were found by archaeologists at an Aztec temple in Mexico. They were assumed to be toys or ornaments. However, years later it was discovered they were a form of whistle or death whistle that made piercing noises similar to a human scream, which the ancient Aztecs may have used during ceremonies, sacrifices, or during battles to strike fear into their enemies. Here's an example of the death whistle in action. Now I want to show you this, I want to share with you this very unique instrument. We call the dead whistle. The dead whistle, the Aztec use for special ceremonies for Day of the Dead celebration. And also they use when they have a war, when they fight with other tribes. They play over a hundred instruments, a hundred dead whistles marching and make a lot of noise to cause a big psychological effects to the enemy. So this is very intimidating instruments and this is very unique. So this is the dead whistle. Dead whistle. It's very unique, very unique. Imagine if I play this instrument in Chicago downtown. <laughs> Modern psychological warfare. Over the course of the 20th century, the scope of psychological warfare has expanded to include not only military applications, but also the local population during peacetime. Introduction of technologies such as radio and television allowed for widespread dissemination of information to the general public. This opened the door for psychological warfare to be implemented on a vast scale during peacetime. Edward Bernays, an early pioneer of public relations and propaganda in the United States, used the techniques of his uncle, psychologist Sigmund Freud, to manipulate the masses. Edward Bernays was instrumental in helping to shift the United States to a more consumerist society. Rather than being seen as citizens, people were seen as consumers. Bernays worked for dozens of major American corporations, including Procter & Gamble and General Electric, for government agencies, politicians, and nonprofit organizations. Some of his accomplishments include a 1929 effort to promote female smoking, which was a taboo at the time, by rebranding cigarettes as feminist torches of freedom, and his work for the United Fruit Company connected with the overthrow of the Guatemalan government in 1954. 
The vision of Bernays was of a utopian society in which individual psychological and emotional energy associated with instinctual biological drives could be harnessed and challenged by a corporate elite for economic benefit. Through the use of mass production, big business could fulfill the cravings of what Bernays saw as the inherently irrational and desire-driven masses, simultaneously securing a mass production economy, as well as stating that he, what he considered to be dangerous animal urges that threatened to tear society apart if left unquelled. Bernays promoted the idea that masses are driven by subconscious instincts, urges, and desires, and therefore their minds can and should be manipulated by a capable few. In his own words, intelligent men must realize that propaganda is the modern instrument by which they can fight for productive ends and help to bring order out of chaos. Another example of modern psychological warfare is Project MKUltra, also called the CIA's Mind Control Program. MKUltra is the code name given to a program of illegal experiments on human subjects that were designed and undertaken by the United States Central Intelligence Agency. Experiments on humans were intended to identify and develop drugs and procedures to be used in interrogations in order to weaken the individual and force confessions. The project was originally through the Office of Scientific Intelligence of the CIA and coordinated with U.S. Army Biological Warfare Laboratories. Project MKUltra was research undertaken by 80 institutions, including colleges and universities, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies. The CIA operated through these institutions using front organizations, although sometimes top officials of these institutions were aware of the CIA's involvement. The project began during a period described as paranoia at the CIA, when the U.S. had lost its nuclear monopoly and fear of communism was at its height. CIA counterintelligence chief James Jesus Angleton believed that a mole had penetrated the organization at the highest levels. The agency poured millions of dollars into studies examining methods of influencing and controlling the mind and enhancing their ability to extract information from resistant subjects during interrogation. One goal of MKUltra and related CIA projects was to create a Manchurian candidate through psychological warfare techniques. A Manchurian candidate is a person, especially a politician, being used as a puppet by an enemy power. The term is commonly used to indicate disloyalty, corruption, or brainwashing, whether intentional or unintentional. One 1955 MKUltra document titled Project MKUltra, the CIA's Program of Research in Behavioral Modification, gives an indication of the far-reaching scope of the program. It refers to studying a wide assortment of mind-altering substances described as follows. Number one, substances which will promote illogical thinking and impulsiveness to the point where the recipient would be discredited in public. Number two, substances which increase the efficiency of mentation and perception. Number three, materials which will cause the victim to age faster or slower in maturity. Number four, materials which will promote the intoxicating effect of alcohol. Number five, materials which will produce the signs and symptoms of recognized diseases in a reversible way so they may be used for malingering, etc. Number six, materials which will cause temporary or permanent brain damage and loss of memory. Number seven, substances which will enhance the ability of individuals to withstand privation, torture, and coercion during investigation and interrogation, so-called brainwashing. Materials and physical methods which will produce amnesia for events preceding and during their use. Number nine, physical methods of producing shock and confusion over extended periods of time and capable of surreptitious use. Number 10, substances which will produce physical disablement, such as paralysis of the legs, acute anemia, etc. Sub number 11, substances which will produce a chemical that can cause blisters. Number 12, substances which alter personality structure in such a way the tendency of the recipient to become dependent on another person is enhanced. Number 13, material which will cause mental confusion of such a type of individual under its influence will find it difficult to maintain a fabrication under questioning. Number 14, substances which will lower the ambition and general working efficiency of men when administered in undetectable amounts. Number 15, substances which will promote weakness and distortion of the eyesight or hearing faculties, preferably without permanent effects. 
Number 16, a knockout pill, which can be surreptitiously administered in drinks, food, cigarettes, as an aerosol, etc. The Church Committee report in 1976 found that in the MK Delta program, drugs were used primarily as an aid to interrogations, but MK Ultra, MK Delta materials were also used for harassment, discrediting, or disabling purposes. Most MK Ultra records were destroyed in 1973 at the order of CIA Director Richard Helms. The program officially ended in the early 1960s, however, there were countless other CIA side projects that continued to be implemented in parallel to MKUltra. One such example includes Dr. L. Wilson Green, who is technical director of the Chemical and Radiological Laboratories at the Army Chemical Center. Dr. Green's ideas were included in a report written by him in 1949 entitled Psychochemical Warfare, A New Concept of War. Dr. Green performed psychochemical as well as radiation experiments on children at the behest of the CIA. This is a video of the testimony of two of the victims of Dr. Green and his experiments given in March of 1995 to the President's Advisory Committee on Radiation Experimentation in Washington, D.C. I'm Christy Nicola, born July of 1962, rendering me 32 years of age. I was a subject in radiation as well as mind control and drug experiments performed by a man I knew as Dr. Green. My parents were divorced around 1966 and Donald Richard Ebner, my natural father, was involved with Dr. Green in the experiments. I was a subject from 1966 to 1976. Dr. Green performed radiation experiments on me in 1970, focusing on my neck throat and chest, 1972 focusing on my chest and my uterus in 1975. Each time I became dizzy, nauseous and threw up. All these experiments were performed on me in conjunction with mind control techniques and drugs in Tucson, Arizona. Dr. Green was using me mostly as a mind control subject from 1966 to 1973. His objective was to gain control of my mind and train me to be a spy assassin. The first significant memory took place at Kansas City University in 1966. Don Ebner took me there by plane when my mom was out of town. I was in what looked like a laboratory and there seemed to be other children. I was strapped down, naked, spread eagle, on a table, on my back. Dr. Green had electrodes on my body, including my head. He used what looked like an overhead projector and repeatedly said he was burning different images into my brain while a red light flashed aimed at my forehead. In between each sequence, he used electric shock on my body and told me to go deeper and deeper, deeper while repeating each image would go deeper into my brain and I would do whatever he told me to do. I felt drugged because he had given me a shot before he started the procedure. When it was over, he gave me another shot. The next thing I remember, I was with my grandparents again in Tucson, Arizona. I was four years old. You can see from this experiment that Dr. Green used trauma, drugs, post-hypnotic suggestion, and more trauma in an effort to gain total control of my mind. These horrible experiments have profoundly affected my life. I developed multiple personality disorder because Dr. Green's goal was to split my mind into as many parts as possible so he could control me totally. He failed, but I've had to endure years of constant physical, mental, and emotional pain even to this day. I've been in therapy consistently for 12 years and it wasn't until I found my current therapist two and a half years ago who had knowledge of the mind control experiments that I've finally been able to make real progress and begin to heal. In closing, I ask that you keep in mind that the memories I've described are but a glimpse of the countless others that took place over the 10 years between 1966 and 1976. That they weren't just radiation, but mind control and drug experiments as well. I have included more detailed information of what I remember in your written documentation. Please help us by recommending an investigation and making the information available so that therapists and other mental health professionals can help more people like myself. 
I know I can get better. I am getting better. And I know others can too, with the proper help. Please help us in an effort to prevent these heinous acts from continuing in the future. Thank you very much. Between the years of 1957 and 1984, I became a pawn in the government scheme whose ultimate goal was mind control and to create the perfect spy, all for the use of chemicals, radiation, drugs, hypnosis, electric shock, isolation in tubs of water, sleep deprivation, brainwashing, verbal, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. I was exploited unwittingly for nearly three decades of my life, and the only explanations given to me were that, quote, the end justifies the means, and, quote, I was serving my country in their bold effort to fight communism. I can only summarize my circumstances by saying they took an already abused seven-year-old child and compounded my suffering beyond belief. The saddest part is, I know for a fact that I was not alone. There were countless other children in my same situation, and there was no one to help us until now. I've already submitted as much information as possible, including conversations uh, overheard of the people, agencies responsible. I'm able to report all this to you in such detail because of my photographic memory and the arrogance of the doctors, the arrogance of the people involved. They were certain they would always control my mind. Although the process of recalling these atrocities is not an easy one, nor is it without some danger to myself and my family, I feel the risk is worth taking. Dr. L. Wilson Green, who claimed to have received $50 million from the Edgewood Chemical and Radiology Laboratory as part of the T TSD, or Technical Science Division of the CIA, once described to Dr. Charles Brown that, quote, children were used as subjects because they were more fun to work with and cheaper, too. They needed lower profile subjects than soldiers or government people. So only young willing females would do. Besides, he said, I like scaring them. They in the agency think I'm a god, creating subjects and experiments for whatever deviant purposes Sid and James can think up. Sid being Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, James, Dr. James Hamilton. In 1958, I was to be tested, they told me, by some important doctors by, from the society, or the Human Ecology Society, and I was instructed to cooperate. I was told not to look at anyone's faces and not try hard not to ignore, to try hard not to ignore any names, as this was a very secret project. But I was told to be brave, and all these things would help me forget. Naturally, as most children do. I did the opposite and remembered as much as I could. Uh, Dr. John Gittinger tested me, Dr. Cameron gave me the shocks, and Dr. Green the x-rays. Then I was told by Sid Gottlieb that, quote, I was right for the big A, or meaning artichoke. By the time I left to go home, just like every time from then on, I would remember only whatever explanations Dr. Robert G. Heath of Tulane Medical University gave me for the odd bruises, needle marks, burns on my head, fingers, and even the genital soreness. I had no reason to believe otherwise. They had already begun to control my mind. The next year, I was sent to a lodge in Maryland called Deep Creek Cabins to learn how to sexually please men. I was taught how to coerce them into talking about themselves, and it was, Doc, it was uh, Richard Helms, who was deputy director of the CIA, Dr. Gottlieb, uh, kept George White, Morris Allen, who all planned on filming as many high government agency officials and heads of academic institutions and foundations as possible, so that later when the fund funding for mind control and radiation started to dwindle, the projects would continue. I was used to entrap many unwitting men, including themselves, all with the use of a hidden camera. I was only nine years old when the sexual humiliation began. I overheard conversations about a part of the agency called ORD, which I found out was Office of Research and Development. It was run by Dr. Green, Dr. Stephen Aldrich, Martin Orne, and Morris Allen. Another modern example of psychological warfare is the methods used by the KGB, the intelligence agency of the Soviet Union, before it collapsed. Yuri Bezmenov, was an ex-KGB agent who defected to Canada in 1970. In February 1970, 
Besmanov clothed himself in hippie attire along with a beard and wig. Then he joined a tour group and later escaped to Athens, Greece. After contacting the American embassy and undergoing extensive interviews with the United States intelligence agencies, Besmanov was granted asylum in Canada by the Trudeau administration. In 1984, he gave an interview to G. Edward Griffin, who at that time was a member of the John Birch Society, an anti-communist group. In the interview, Besmanov explained the methods used by the KGB, known as ideological subversion of the political system of the United States. In the following video, he explains what ideological subversion is, according to the former KGB. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type of, of, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of it intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result? The result you can see. Most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of the uh, of, uh, United States society. And yet these people who've been programmed and, as you say, in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept, mm -hmm. these are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock, when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, Obviously, they will revolt. They, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. 
And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they obviously they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here you can you can get. Uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. This they don't understand and uh, it will be greatest shock for them, of course. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's over fulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flab, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with the benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will go to Moscow to kiss the bottoms of, of new generation of Soviet assassins, never mind. He will create false illusions that the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. United States is in the state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. And, and the initiator of this war is not Comrade Andropov, of course. Uh, it's, it's the system However ridiculous it may sound, the world communist system or the world communist conspiracy, whether I scare some people or not, I don't give a hoot. Uh, if, if you are not scared by now, nothing can scare you. But you don't have to be paranoid about it. What, what actually happens now, that unlike myself, you have literally several years to live on unless the United States wake up 
the, the time bomb is ticking with every second. The disaster is coming closer and closer. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to. Another good, more recent example of psychological warfare is the war in Syria between the Syrian government, Russia, the US, Iran, Israel, and Turkey. A group known as the White Helmets, officially designated as Syria Civil Defense, is branded as a volunteer organization that operates in rebel-controlled Syria, supposedly performing urban search and rescue operations in response to bombing, medical evacuation, evacuation of civilians from dangerous areas. The group is financed by the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID. The UK Conflict Stability and Security Fund, CSSF, as well as additional funds from the Danish, Canadian, Netherlands, German, and Japanese governments. The leader of the group, Raid Salah, rose to media prominence through his leadership of a group proclaimed as Saviors of All Humanity. Since its formation in late 2013 in Istanbul, Turkey, the White Helmets claim to be Syria's only viable first responders, selflessly saving some 72,000 lives in only three years, regardless of the victim's ethnicity, religious convictions, or political aspirations, according to their promotional literature. Raid Selah has become the public face of the White Helmets, the White Helmet mantra of neutral, impartial humanitarian has been an integral part of their psychological campaign in persuading the public of their legitimacy as an aid organization, despite evidence to the contrary. Raid Salah has also been with the group since the early days of their establishment in 2013 by a British ex-military officer, James Le Maizier. We have been told that Le Maizier left the British Army in 2000 and joined the UN serving as deputy head of the advisory unit on security and justice and special representative of the Secretary General's security policy body for the UN mission in Kosovo. He then made his way to Jerusalem where he worked on implementing the Ramallah Agreement, then to Baghdad as a special advisor to Iraqi Minister of the Interior, and then to the United Arab Emirates to train their gas field protection force. After the UAE, he later went to Lebanon during the 2006 war. In 2005, he was made vice president for f special projects at a private mercenary firm, the Olive Group. In May 2015, the Olive Group merged with Constellus Holdings, who owns Academy, a previously known as the Blackwater Group. After 9-11, President George W. Bush enabled the CIA to subcontract their assassinations. Blackwater was awarded the contract for these killings. In 2008, Le Maizier joined Good Harbor International, another private security organization whose CEO is Richard A. Clark, who served the Reagan, George H. W. Bush, Clinton, and George W. Bush administrations. He served as Bill Clinton's and George W. Bush's anti-terror czar. Western corporate media sources have praised the White Helmets as humanitarian heroes. The group even got an Academy Award for their acting job on the Netflix film, as well as the Nobel Peace Prize. However, Raid Salah, the leader of the White Helmets, was not able to come to the United States because of previous ties to terror groups, according to the FBI. Vanessa Beely, an independent British investigative journalist on the ground in Syria interviewed Syrian civilians from East Aleppo about their experiences with the group and did her own investigation on the group's activities. In an al-Nusra terrorist group video filmed on May 5, 2015, one of their members in Aleppo executes a civilian. Moments after the execution, several white helmets appear on the scene to remove the body in a body bag. Afterwards, the White Helmets had to respond to valid accusations of collusion, which they denied. Here is the video. Yeah, we're surfing. 
يجوا لهون يساعدوا الناس لا ما يساعدوا الناس بس يشيلوا الجرحى يشيلوا الموكب طب ولا بس كان يساعد دفاع مدني كان في دفاع مدني ساعد نو ذير از نو سو نوت Armed groups the first priority. But did they help the civilians? And what were the hospitals being used for? And were the terrorists preventing them from leaving? Yes. How? And the one who killed those families are from Nusra Front. It's early morning and they're planning an attack. Their way of defending East Aleppo is to hit back by sending suicide bombers to the Syrian army. They don't help people, they only work when there is a camera on them, and when the camera is gone they leave. They abandon people under the rubble. They told us to pull the bodies out by ourselves. This man accused the organization of intentionally killing his little girl. I took her to the civil defense hospital and they gave her an injection filled with air to kill her. You ever see in Fardus men with white helmets, they're called the white helmets of the civil defense, helping people when they were injured. When they came to help the injured, they stole from them. If people were wearing jewelry, they cut it off. All of them are thieves. Some of them are honest, but many are just thieves. They see gold and they take it.
And were they treating any civilians? The White Helmets present themselves as an impartial non-profit organization, just there to help. But if an organization is funded primarily by foreign governments who are directly trying to overthrow Syria's democratically elected government, how can they be seen as an independent relief organization? Why is this all being done? What's the goal? The primary function of the White Helmets is to produce propaganda that is used to pull on people's heartstrings around the world, using images of dead and injured children, civilians, to encourage more direct foreign military intervention to implement regime change and depose the secular Syrian government that is supported by the majority of Syria's citizens, as shown in the elections held in June 2014. Although the terrorist groups attempted to disrupt the election and it was dismissed in the United States as fraud, turnout was 73% of registered voters, with 88% voting for President Bashar al-Assad. Representatives from 30 countries reported that the election was free, fair, accurate, and transparent. The internet has become a worldwide platform to spread information and ideas even more quickly than previous methods, such as television and radio, the 21st century equivalent of the printing press recently being invented, in other words. With many people in every country with their own smartphones and internet access, establishment media stories can be challenged before the establishment has a chance to control the narrative. This was not the case in the past. Stories often leak before they're reported on, and the establishment media tries to spin the story in their favor, after the fact. While the internet has brought a voice to those who did not have one before, it also creates a new set of challenges for overcoming psychological warfare tactics in the future. So part of what we're trying to do to achieve those goals is like, take really big audacious points of view on the world, and then train ourselves to be patient. And it's really, really hard. The entire society is set up to not be patient anymore. Consumer internet businesses are about exploiting psychology. And that is one where you want to fail fast because, you know, people are unpredictable. And so we want to psychologically figure out how to manipulate you as fast as possible and then give you back that dopamine hit. We did that at, brilliantly at Facebook. Instagram has done it. WhatsApp has done it. You know, Snapchat has done it. Twitter has done it. So there are great examples. WeChat is doing it. There are great examples of Failing fast is the right path to exploiting psychology of mass populations of people. I feel tremendous guilt. Um, I, think we, I think we all knew in the back of our minds, even though we feigned this whole line of like, there probably aren't any really bad unintended consequences. I think in the back, deep, deep recesses of our minds, we, we kind of knew something bad could happen. But I think the way we defined it was not like this. I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying. <laughs> because it, the, un, the unintended consequences of, 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 a, of a network when it grows to a billion or two billion people, and it, and it, begin, and it, it literally changes your relationship with society, with each other, with you know, it, 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 it probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. It, God only knows what it's doing to, to our children's brains. You know, if the, if the thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it, that thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you, 
you know, more likes and comments. I mean, it's a, it's a val it's a social validation feedback loop that, that it's like a, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. That is truly where we are. And I would encourage all of you as the future leaders of the world to really internalize how important this is. If you feed the beast, that beast will destroy you. If you push back on it, we have a chance to control it and rein it in. And it is a point in time where people need to hard break from some of these tools and the things that you rely on. The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. And it's not an American problem. This is not about Russian ads. This is a global problem. So we are in a really bad state of affairs right now, in my opinion. It is, it is eroding the core foundations of how people behave by and between each other. Um, and I don't have a good solution. You know, my solution is I just don't use these tools anymore. After these two executives left the company, Facebook did not stop trying to learn more about the human brain to exploit the vulnerability even further. In April of 2017, at Facebook's Innovation Division 8 building, Regina Dugan, head of Facebook's Hardware Innovation Division, revealed that Facebook was working on a method to allow the user to type words onto a screen without having to speak. They will simply be able to look at the person's phone camera or computer's webcam to think the words and it will type out on the screen automatically. Another emerging piece of technology that will become easier in the coming years will be the ability to completely fabricate videos and people, the equivalent of Photoshop for videos. This video from research at the University of Washington shows how with only an audio alone, somebody could completely fabricate somebody else speaking. Uh, Barack Obama is used as an example. Given this audio as input. It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. Our method produces the following output. It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Here's the ground truth video of Obama saying the same words. Especially our friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. I visited with the families of many of the victims on Thursday, and one thing I told them is that they're not alone. The American people and people all over the world are standing with them, and we always will. The investigation is ongoing, but we know that the killer was an angry and disturbed individual who took in extremist information and propaganda over the internet and became radicalized. During his killing spree, he pledged allegiance to ISIL, a group that's called on people around the world to attack innocent civilians. Here we compare to these at all who used the Grand Tooth Mouth region to drive the animation on the left. It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. Note that our method uses audio only and does not have access to the ground truth video. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando, especially our friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. The heart of our method is a recurrent neural network that transforms input audio to a time-varying mouth shape. Now, most of us don't get our healthcare through the marketplace. We get it through our job or through Medicare or Medicaid. Then, we synthesize mouth texture. And what you should know is that, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. You now Next, we enhance details and teeth. Now have free preventive care. There are no more annual or lifetime limits on essential health care. Finally, we blend the mouth texture onto a retime target video and match the pose. Women can get free checkups, and you can't get charged more just for being a woman. Young people can stay on a parent's plan until they turn 26. Seniors get discounts on their prescriptions. And no one can be denied coverage just because of a pre-existing condition. To demonstrate the power of the method, we apply the same input speech mapped to four different target videos. Note that all four are synthetic and have different lighting conditions. The auto industry, 
to help families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high-tech manufacturing, clean energy, and the infrastructure that creates good new jobs. Not to mention the job training that helps folks earn new skills to fill those jobs. The results are clear. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. We've seen the first sustained manufacturing growth since the 90s. We've cut unemployment by more than half. Another 20 million Americans have health insurance. We show an application that creates a short summary video from a longer speech by manually selecting the desired text to include. Note that the result is completely seamless. While our results were similar to Bethalsis et al. from SIGGRAPH 2012, they required the original footage, and we do not. Hey everybody. Today, 20 million more American adults know the financial security of health insurance. On top of that, another 3 million more kids have coverage than when I took office. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. We get it through our job, or through Medicare or Medicaid. And what you should know is that you now have free preventive care. There are no more annual or lifetime limits on essential health care. Women can get free checkups and you can't get charged more just for being a woman. We can also change the sentence order for a better flow. Enrollment is open right now, but only until January 31st. Go to healthcare.gov or call 1-800-318-2596 and someone will personally help you find a plan that's right for you. We show the lip sync quality from our network trained using different sizes of training data. And law enforcement communities have already prevented many attacks, saved many lives, and we won't let up. And law enforcement communities have already prevented many attacks, saved many lives, and we won't let up. And law enforcement communities have already prevented many attacks, saved many lives, and we won't let up. And law enforcement communities have already prevented many attacks, saved many lives, and we won't let up. Notice how the lip sync quality is better and has less jitter as the size increases. And law enforcement communities have already prevented many attacks, saved many lives, and we won't let up. With the exponential increase of monitoring and surveillance technology, it will be easier in the next few years to gather data about a particular target and use the information to frame the individual or fabricate video of them in order to discredit or imprison them if they are dissenters. The data that each individual provides on social media also can become a liability as well. In the past, before the era of the internet, those in power wishing to use propaganda had to guess what would work, basically. Today, a complex web of computer programs and algorithms can, over time, calculate and predict most human behavior. This means that those in charge of these tools, including major corporations, governments, intelligence agencies, and police, will be armed with more information about you and able to stack the deck to maintain their control. Perhaps if people are aware that these techniques are being used on them, they might be able to resist its influence. The battlefield and the tools are always changing, but those in power trying to do everything they can to control what the public sees, what they hear, what they say, and what they think.